Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Tuesday seminars uh, on the cerebellum. Today, we have uh, Robi Sutidjo, who uh, um, received his medical degree from Indonesia and then uh, decided to come to the United States and was uh, admitted to the PhD program in bioengineering at University of Washington, where he has stayed for his entire career. And he's had a really significant contributions with uh, 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 his two mentors, Albert Fuchs and Chris Kaneko, on studying the role of the cerebellum in control of eye movements, particularly saccades. And he was really instrumental in teaching us uh, um, the contributions of the cerebellum to control of saccades. Roby, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, th thank you, Mesa, for the introduction. All right, so, so here's the, the title of my talk, which is the closed loop optogenetic perturbation of the macaque cerebellum. Well, exactly, it's in the oculomotor vernis. So our lab is to use SCAT as the model of the motor system. As, as you know, this is what SCAT look like and why we need the SCAT, as you can read it yourself, basically. But the biggest point that I want to make is the last one. Oh, I hope you can. Oops, sorry. Uh, I seem to lost my pen. All right. So it's the last one here. We know that Zakat is so fast, it's, it needs to get to the really high speed. But at the same time, you want it to be accurate and also precise, which means the variability is low. In engineering, it's, this thing is actually require a lot of trade-off and it's really a challenging to do. Then the question is, how does the brain do it, right? So before we go any further, okay, let's look at the neural circuit of the saccade from the superior colliculus and below. So this is the saccadic system from the superior colliculus and below. And this also show you basically the connection between the cerebellum, which is here, the oculomotor vernis, lobules 6C and 7 and the CFN, and also the saccade, the brainstem saccade burst generator. So the colliculus will burst. Say, for example, you want to make right with the car, then the left colliculus will burst. It will send the burst to the brain stem burst generator. It will make them burst. And the burst, as the, which is the motor command, it's, it's sent to the motor neuron and eventually move the eyes. But at the same time, the circuit also, I mean, the colliculus also send its signal to the nucleus reticularis tegmenti pontis, an RTP here, which is sent as a MOSI fiber to the OMV and the CFN. And then it, the CFN project back to the brain stem burst generator. So here we have two pathways. The cerebellum is the parallel pathway of the direct pathway from the colliculus to the brain stem. And the brain stem burst generator in turn, also send MOSI fiber input to the OMV and the CFN. So now let's look at the close up of the, the brain stem burst generator on the right. So all the red circuit here indicate that the, the, you have them active. So, but between a SCAD, when you fixate, the OPN active and everybody else is quiet except. Well, everybody else is not bursting. Well, this is what I mean, quiet. So, and then the colliculus, the left colliculus. So we want to make a rightward saccade here. So the colliculus will, left colliculus will fire, will burst, and send their burst to the right EBN, EBN here, and also the IBN. And the IBN will pause, inhibit, will make the uh, OPN pause to inhibit them so that the EPN can respond to the signal from the colliculus and create the motor command for the saccade as the burst, send to the motor neuron and contract the, uh, contract the muscle, move the eye to the right. And the IBN also send a copy of its signal and inhibiting the opposite, the opposing muscle, the, the, uh, the left, abducens so that it does not hinder the saccade, it does not thwart the scar. So the scar can easily move to the right. So, but at the same time, the IBN also in inhibiting the EBN 
and the IBN on the left side. That's why they acquired. So, but in contrast to this left quiet, right active on the brain, in the brainstem, in the cerebellum, left and right, they both active, they're both bursting, right? So now the, the, the question is that, well, we can make sense that, okay, let me see, where is my, again, sorry. So how does this uh, left CFN, which project to the active uh, side of the brainstem, which it makes sense, it can influence them directly, right? But the right CFN here, this is, uh, at, at least for me, I'm not sure what they are doing actually, because they actually influence the part of the brain that is actually inhibited, that is quiet. So, and then next, obviously, the, as you know, that the P cell in the oculomotor vernis actually inhibited the CFM. So, so in short, the, the circuit does not tell us how SCAT that can be fast and accurate. And moreover, what is actually surprising is that SCAT is also robust to perturbation. Basically, you perturb it and it still get to the target. So let's look into that. So here, the one of the early perturbation experiment that was done is actually OPN electrical stimulation. As you, as I told you before, that the OPN inhibited the EPN, the excitatory burst neuron. So on the right here, A is. Uh, you see from the top is the velocity and then the position for the rightward and position for the leftward and then uh, velocity for the leftward. It is the control saccades and it is done in the dark. So in B, uh, short electrical stimu stimulation of the OPN was delivered as you imagine because they are inhibit inhibiting the EBN, so SCAT quickly decelerated both sides because they project to both left and right EBN. But SCAT quickly recover and their accuracy was still there. It's still getting to the target in the dark. But as you delay the time of the stimulus or you make this OPN stimulation longer, you started to truncate the SCAD, basically the velocity get to zero. But again, SCAD still recover. That's made, it makes another SCAD to correct that and then reach the target. So that's what I mean that they are so robust. And Reza's lab has also done similar thing using a, a TMS stimulation and also see the same thing. And the robustness is not just from the stimulation, but it's also from slowing. So here, these two experiments injected uh, either a musimol or lidocaine in the ponds. So we can see here that the square here is the velocity and the triangle is the duration of the saccad. Before injection is spray, uh, once you injected the musimol, the peak velocity, as you expect, decreases. But at the same time, the duration increases. And the amplitude is basically more or less is actually normometric. There is slight sagging, but it is uh, very good. And it's the same story here for the lidocaine injection. So before injection, this is the control, as you can see here. And then as lidocaine act is so fast. So as soon as you injected it, the peak velocity decrease immediately, but at the same time, lidocaine effect is short acting. So you can see that the peak velocity of the saccade grow, but at the same time, the duration also decreases. And this is another experiment. And there is a little effect only in, in the beginning of the injection that you start getting a small amplitude decrease, but the amplitude eventually recover basically normal metric. So here we, my message here is that there is a reciprocal linear relation between saccade peak velocity and saccade duration. And 
one thing that make me realize or make uh, Robinson realize actually probably and others too that scat accuracy robustness against interruption suggests that it may use uh, it, that what in engineering is called a negative local feedback loop. So let's look into that. So right, so the this is what the local feedback SCART generator circuit that uh, is shown here. So let's start with the displacement command that's coming from the colliculus, right? So it say it tells you move 20 degree to the right. So, and then we start with the predicted because the eye is not moving, the predicted, predicted eye displacement is zero. So then the burst neuron would respond to the displacement command to produce a motor command, a burst that drives the motor neuron and move the eyes. And the motor command, copies of the motor command, is, is going to the displacement integrator. This is kind of a mathematical integration. And it is used to predict the eye displacement. So, and then as you compare, the displacement command and then the predicted uh, eye displacement, when this difference reaches zero, eventually there's nothing more driving the burst neuron. The, and then motor command is becoming zero, then the eye stop, right? So, and the second integrator is actually is there to integrate the burst so that the eye doesn't sag back. So it keeps the eye in place. So, and this thing is actually nicely explained the all the data that I showed you previously. So this is the OPN stimulation. And what you do is simply you interrupted the burst neuron activity by inhibiting them by this pulse, negative pulse. And as you can see, it's exactly replicating the, the OPN stimulation there. So you see that the uh, velocity decreases, but it recovers again, and the saccade reaches the, the target. And then it's as, uh, the same thing uh, for the slowing of the burst neuron. Basically, you inhibit the burst neuron so that their gain is smaller. Then, as you can see, that the activity of the burst neuron decreases, then the peak velocity decreases, but it compensated, the feedback compensated that it stretched the duration of the cigar so that it will get close to the target. It is just the way the circuit is that you will, in this kind of circuit, you will never get exactly on target when you reduce the gain of the circuit. So, but now the question is that there's one experiment that has never been done yet. So suppose if we can find the displacement integrator, and we do exact experiment. Basically, you inhibit them momentarily, briefly inhibit them. So then this is what you would expect. So nothing should happen on the velocity because you're not affecting this, this guy. You're only affecting here. So then, but you change the state of the displacement integrator. That's mean here you're reducing what is stored there. Basically, say it's storing eight degree, now you put inhibition, now it's becoming six degree, for example. Then what happens is that it will compensate by re-accelerating the saccade, right? Because the difference is now larger. So it will drive the saccade further and it will make it hypermetria and it will never be compensated. So, all right, so, and then it, this is to, and this exact model is actually, what we have been talking about, the internal model, at least for the saccadic system, the internal model of the cerebellum. So the burst neuron pathway here is represent the inverse model. As you can see, it has to convert, estimate what the outcome displacement of the eyes, including how fast they are, et cetera, from the displacement comment. So, and, but on the other hand, the, the, the feedback here represents the forward model that actually take the copy of the motor command and predict the displacement. So 
But now you will have a question. I showed you Oplomoto Fermis and CFN before. What, what is the role of the OMV and CFN here? And then what would happen if you inactivate the CFN? So let's go into the next slide. So this is an experiment that was done by Rick Robinson, the musimal micro injection in the left CFN here. So the black here are the control saccades. So as you can immediately see, the ipsiversive direction, which is the leftward saccade, they're becoming hypermetric. And the contraversive direction, which is the rightward saccade, they're becoming hypometric. And also they increase their variability. But for the vertical saccade, they become biased to the left. So, well, you can think this, this thing is that because SCAD in the old days, they, this thing is just like a push-pull mechanism. And it, indeed, I mean, if, if your push-pull is exactly correct, then everything is balanced, then your vertical SCAD will be straight. So if you one side is damaged and one side becoming larger and the other side becoming shorter. But is that actually true? So... Then, where do the CFN act on the feedback circuit? As I told you, there are a push-pull mechanism. That's one possible answer, right? So is it outside the loop? So if they are outside the loop, they are simply modifying the displacement command, right? And as, so that can explain that nicely. But at the same time, it can also be inside the loop, affecting component in this loop. So for example, so that actually is very difficult to dissociate uh, these two. So, but we think that if we can have a control and precise short activity perturbation, just like the, uh, the stimulation of the OPM. But the problem with the electrical stimulation is that you activated everything, right? You're not really specific. So it's really hard to interpret. So we might be able to figure out what they actually are doing. So this is what uh, we set to do. Here we express the uh, channel rhodopsin, right, in the Burkinji cell, and then we detected the uh, the I velocity at certain threshold. And we use them to trigger uh, the laser here to create a pulse. And the laser will shine the OMV. And this is what the optical fiber look like. And when we, you shine the channel rhodopsin, ex, 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 uh, uh, a piece cell that express channel rhodopsin, it will increase their activity. And at the same time, because it inhibit the CFN, it will decrease the CFN activity. And here, we used a 24 degree saccade. And we stimulated at four different times randomly during the saccades. So the red here, which we call this thing you need to remember to follow the next slides. Uh, T0, which means it is triggered at the onset of the saccade, but because of the system delay, it's, about, it's happening about six milliseconds after the onset of the saccade. And T10 is 10 milliseconds later. So everything is 10 milliseconds later from the previous one. So it's so, but in reality, it's about 16 milliseconds. T20 blue is about 26 milliseconds, and T30 is about 36 milliseconds after the onset of the saccade. So this is what it is look like when it's happening during the saccade. So the time here is relative to saccade onset, red, green, blue. Round T0, T10, T20, and T30. And they appear randomly during the saccade, including the control saccade. So now, what is the prediction? Well, as you, if they are, but if the CFN is outside the loop, as I said uh, earlier, that means brief contra inhibition would produce hypometria. Contra here means contraversive or, or, or contralateral of the movement relative to the movement. So, and brief Ipsy CFN will produce hypermetria. And because they, uh, their effect is outside the loop, you expect that the, their latency doesn't 
it would be equal. You perturbing either direction, contraversive or ipsiversive, they should have the same latency. So basically, it is just an evidence for a push-pull control displacement. But what happens if you are if they are actually acting in the loop? So as you remember, the contra CFN is actually projecting to the on first neuron in the brainstem. So that means the brief contra CFN would inhibition would produce slower saccade, but it should be near normal metric due to the feedback loop compensation here. And short latency, remember, because they are on, right? You just change the activity, they just quickly uh, express in the movement. But what happened in the Ipsy CFN? So the brief if Ipsy CFN inhibition should produce a normal speed because you don't affect the burst neuron at all, right? But it will reduce the integrated signals. That means it will make your prediction of the displacement wrong, which means too small, which lead to hypermetria, and of course, no compensation, right? And then we don't know about the latency, but my guess it will be a longer latency, as you remember that the Ipsy CFN is projected to the off side of the brainstem. So it likely to be longer as if, if we believe the, uh, the simulation. Okay, now let's first look at the example response of the perturbation. So the, here is the example of two experiments in two monkeys. One is, we call it SQ, which means squirrel, and the other is Tommy, TM. So from top to bottom is a position, velocity, acceleration, and the red is the control, unstimulated. So for SQ, let's start from A. So we, you immediately see that the, the pulse here is 30 millisecond longer, 30 millisecond long. So and you can see the effect, it takes so long, even after it wait until the pulse is gone, actually, until the light is off. It's about six milliseconds later, then you start detecting the, the effect here. The effect is re-acceleration, which can you, you can see here. And it makes the saccade hypermetria here. But the effect is completely the opposite for rightward saccade. It slow the saccade because of the quick deceleration here. But after some time, you see a, a bump here, basically like a inflection here. That's actually corresponding to that point. That saccades become re-accelerated. There is a compensation happen here. And then it reaches very close to the intended target. But now what happened with the Tommy? It looks similar, except it's the opposite. So for leftward saccade, you get a slow saccade and you get some compensation that's happening here. And then you get normal metric, saccade gets there. So, and it's the same thing as uh, in squirrel leftward, the rightward saccade for Tommy, uh, you get saccade as a fact that is way after the stimulation the stimulation is done. So basically it's about 21 or 22 milliseconds after the onset of the stimulus and start detecting the effect of re-acceleration here. And you, you can see it here. But the effect is so small that the duration of the saccade is not affected that much. So basically saccade is uh, end at about the same time. And the effect as you expect is Hypermetria. So here the, the point is, the, is that different effect for leftward and rightward saccade. So now the first thing to do, we must figure out what ipsiversive and what contraversive. So, and that was actually T0 pulses, if you didn't notice. So in A here, we plotted the amplitude chains against 
the track location that after we squeeze them horizontally, so basically just on the horizontal look, uh, coordinate, zero is the midline. Yeah, zero is the midline. And as you can see here in Tommy, right? Red is right with scat and black is left with scat. In Tommy, the right with scat tends to be hypometria, but the left with scat tends to be hypermetria. Uh, in Tommy is the opposite. So, and all of this is actually, excuse me, in, in, in squirrel, all this scat that I circle here are located on the left side of the middle of the midline. And in Tommy, think that this is on the right side of the midline. So right wood scat tend to be hypermetria, and the left wood scat tend to be hypometria. It's basically the two regression is in the opposite direction. And then now we compare the two direction against each other in B. So we can see that the left word Amplitude chain, the left with scat for Tommy is hypermetric. And for not Tommy, squirrel, I mean, and then for Tommy, the right word scat is, well, it's include here too, I think. Is hypermetria. So then we conclude that we group six experiment in squirrel together and seven experiment together, and we group them according to, but by a convention that leftward, squirrel leftward is ipsy, and Tommy rightward is ipsy, and vice versa. And this thing is, C it shows you the exact location of the track. So each circle is a one location, and it's different symbol is different experiment including some of the D that we only did in Tommy. That, uh, this is kind of a different experiment uh, way later in the slides. So, and then here we compare the peak speed chains against amplitude chains. And then here, basically you can see that the direction with reduced velocity usually are accompanied by close to normal metric or slightly of some a little hypometric of the scars. But those with unchanged peak velocity they tend to be hypermetric. So those are the message on for these slides. So okay now let's look after we perform a population average on this experiment. So now let's look what happened. As you recall, red is T0, green is T10, which is basically 10 milliseconds later. So each column is the same thing. It's basically position, velocity, and acceleration. So for Ipsy, so and we group them Ipsy and Contra now. So for Ipsy, you can see immediately that the re-accelerating effect during deceleration phase right and which lead to hypermetria and one of the cool thing that you see here the effects start at the same time so basically oops sorry so the effect here is time locked to the movement it's not time locked to the stimulus so now let's look at uh, Tommy. It's basically the same result. You get reacceleration here, reacceleration there. But again, the effect is so close together. It's basically time locked to the movement. It's only about two millisecond difference here for 10 millisecond shift in the stimulus. But for contra, it's completely the opposite effect. And the first symptom is that you get a decelerating effect that you see here that lead to the lower peak velocity, but amplitude does not significantly change because you have a compensation that happened here. And then for Tommy, it's the same thing. You get decelerating effect that reduce 
peak velocity and you get a compensation extend your duration of course it has to and then for red for t0 you basic tommy basically normal metric there's slight hyper hypometria for the green for the later pulses and the latency of the, the effect is actually time lock to the stimulus it which is about five to seven milliseconds now let's continue for the later stimulus and all this later stimulus is basically all the effect happening during the deceleration phase of the saccade so it's the same criteria as before so you see larger re-accelerating effects on the ipsi and you produce more hypermetria and again it's no longer time lock to the movement so you get shorter latency from uh, t0 and the t10 pulses the same for both animal but for contra the effect on sq is much smaller but you can still see that for t uh t t20 pulse you st still see some deceleration here right and then Scott will uh, recover. And then there is, you can still see here that Scott is slides out slowly. It's still trying to recover itself. But of course, you don't have enough time because you are in the deceleration phase. So, but again, for Tommy, the effect is so small that the eventual effect on the Scott amplitude is becoming is, is small. But for Tommy, it's uh, the opposite. It has a much stronger effect. Again, Tommy is a new animal. Squirrel has been used for many, many experiments, and it's more damage in the OMV. We are surprised that this still works. So for time, Tommy, you can still see for T20, you get a deceleration here. But again, and also you get some compensation that stretches the amplitude. Basically, this cut is just sliding out, just like a glissade, basically. But for later pulse, you notice here on the brown, they tend to basically mostly truncate the scat. Basically, you, you stop scat before it's actually ended. You basically shorten uh, the amplitude. So that's the message for, for that. Now let's now we have all of this it's kind of confusing now let's look at the summary of the timing so this thing is the summary of the those four perturbation including the including the control t0 t10 t20 and t30 and the asterisk blue here shows you when the stimulus happen all the error bar here is two standard deviation because i'm trying to get it close to 95% confidence interval. So as you can see, I told you before that the Ipsi is time lock, right? So this is the red here, the diamond here, shows you when the effect is detected. So basically no chains, and then for squirrel, and there's some slight about two millisecond chains in Tommy. So in response to 10 millisecond chains, in the stimulus time. But as you go further, the latency, which is basically just the distance of the, the distance of these two, becoming shorter and shorter. So that's that. And then as you know, because the Ipsi stimulation or Ipsi perturbation doesn't affect the peak velocity, no change in the timing of the Big velocity. And as you notice here, the T20 stimulus is happening around the peak of the scat. So this is the peak velocity timing. Oh, you can also say it as an acceleration duration because the Y axis here is aligned on the zero is mean the scat onset. And it's the same thing for Tommy. But as you expect though, because you're increasing the duration of the movement, then you expect that the saccade duration will go up, right? Will become longer. And that's what you see here. And variability is 
either slightly smaller than the control or about the same. They are not significant. And then for Tommy, as I told you before, even though you see the acceleration, but for both T0 and T10, the duration doesn't change that much, but for later poles, it's, it's increasing significantly. And again, the variability of the duration doesn't change that much. But it's, for the contra, it's kind of the opposite. But first, let's look at the latency. So this is when the stimulus happen and when it's, the effect is detected is on the red. They are all about the same time. And as and for the last one, for the T30 here, the, in Tom is only one experiment out of six is actually produce a, a significant change. So that's why I put this here. Of course, you expect them to be, uh, has a longer uh, longer uh, latency because of so, so weak effect. So, but for Tommy, it's just uh, like a machine. The stimulus just basically produce the same latency. But and, and then as you expect, because it's decelerating the scars, it will decrease the time, make, make the time of the peak velocity earlier. But for later stimulus, the, the effect on the velocity is less, so it's, it's becoming closer to the control. And certainly true for the T20 and the T30 stimulus. Now, as you can see, that reducing the peak velocity in, in the contra produce a compensatory movement, right? A compensatory reacceleration. So that will increase the duration. But at the same time, also increase the variability of the duration. And in fact, the, varia uh, the variability of the duration is increased, is higher in all of these cases, and even worse here, as you can see. So at the end, so at T30, at the latest stimulus, uh, the average duration is about the same as the control. But let's, uh, we will look into that uh, further uh, details. Now let's look at the real data of the kinematics and the matrix. I hope I can still make it. I probably need about seven more minutes. So this is the metric and kinematic changes by uh, induced by the light poles. So peak velocity here at the top, acceleration amplitude, deceleration amplitude, and scarp amplitude. Uh, I can just easily set for Ipsy, no change in the peak velocity for both animal, no change in the acceleration amplitude, nothing here. But as you can expect, deceleration amplitude increases with later pulse. And of course, scarp amplitude increase. And then for the contra, the biggest effect is produced by the earliest pulse, which you get reduction of the peak velocity, and of course, acceleration amplitude uh, decreases, but because of the compensation, the deceleration amplitude increase. And then you get still get a hypometria, but it's much, much less. And in Tommy, it's the same story. You get a reduction peak velocity, reduction of acceleration amplitude, and increase the acceleration amplitude to compensate, and you get normal metric. And there's one thing before I forget to notice here is that the variability of the saccade amplitude is much smaller than either than both the acceleration amplitude and deceleration amplitude. This actually suggests that deceleration amplitude is compensation compensated for the variability of the acceleration amplitude. I will show you that later. So and again, for Tommy, so let's uh, concentrate on Tommy after this. So the later pulse of the contra is actually still affecting the acceleration amplitude. And you get slight increase on the deceleration amplitude, but still produce more uh, hypometria. And now the acceleration amplitude is not affected, but the deceleration amplitude becoming smaller <laughs> because there is a truncated saccade and then Scott amplitude is smaller and the same story as uh, the latest pulse, which is uh, T30 pulses. So, all right, so we go to that. So we're trying to talk about the relation, you know, about you expect that acceleration amplitude is so varied, deceleration amplitude so varied, but Scott amplitude variability shrink. 
And the reason is compensation. And then as you expect that the black here is the control, this is the range of uh, acceleration amplitude for that 24 degree control circuits. But so as the uh, acceleration amplitude increases, the acceleration amplitude decreases. So even in the control circuit, the, the deceleration is really compensating for what happened in the acceleration. So here for the IPC, the story is that you see that most of these are basically just offset up. So basically, what I did in the Ipsy when I perturb the Ipsy side of the OMV, they just basically added an offset. And will be carried, it never forget about that offset, and, and will be expressed as a hypermetria. But in the contra, is the graph is uh, looks complicated. This is kind of last minute for me. I should have put a histogram to make it easier to read. But for the T0, as you expect, you get a slowing of the cigar. That's mean acceleration amplitude here. They tend to concentrate more here and, and will produce a larger deceleration amplitude. And it's the same thing for the for squirrel that they tend to be more concentrated here. So, and then for the later pulses, especially for the T20 and T30, you can start seeing that they are more, more of them are actually below the black, the control. It's actually here too. There is evidence for truncation there. We will see that later. Okay, now I told you before, right? I mean, Saka duration get becoming far more variable. Of course, because they are actually due to the compensation for in the contraversive saka. Now let's look into that. Now, as you expect, right, the lower peak velocity due to the light will create uh, more compensation. So that means longer duration. So that's what we see here in T0. So here in the control, you can see that for different, uh, as the, Peak velocity decreases, scat duration increases. That's this old story now. So, and that relation still hold for perturbed scat. It's actually emphasizing the compensatory that's happening for contraversive scat for T zero and also still happening for T zero. Even though the range of the peak velocity is less because the pulse is happening later, closer to the peak velocity. You don't have much time to uh, reduce that peak velocity much. So it's same story in Tommy too. That, that's basically it. You still have the same uh, rela linear relationship. And as you can see here, the, the histogram of the to saccade duration is becoming wider for the perturbed saccade, for the red and the green here, for the T0 and the T10. That's explain why you have wider variability in the in the duration. So that's basically what I'm saying. So so now next is that for the T20 and T30 things are a little bit different. So because the effect are mostly on the on the deceleration. So I'm just concentrating on the deceleration duration here. So then we plot it against the peak velocity. And then I just go quickly here, is that you notice for the T20 that the graph, the histogram of the, of the uh, stimulation at T20 is actually shifted down, basically shifted to the shorter duration. And actually some of them here have very, short duration and actually some of this so they are actually truncated so if you are fast you are more likely to be truncated but as if you are slow you still have some as you are, your scat is slow well in the, uh, naturally you will have a longer duration anyway so then your stimulus appear as if they are earlier right does it make sense here so then you still have time to compensate by increasing the duration. And the story is even clearer for T30, that 
you see a lot more scat, fast, fast scat get truncated. But the longer duration scat, because your stimulus is actually happening as if they, they were actually earlier in a way, because they are actually programmed slower. So they are still being compensated. But still, the compensation is not complete because you still have hypo hypometrium. The same effect is actually happening in squirrel too, except that we don't have much data for this uh, annual test. We have to do so many experiments for the 2017 paper. But you still see the same thing. The longer du duration here is coming from the slower saccade because the slower saccade, they have more time to be compensated. But the faster saccade, they have less time, they are more likely to be truncated. And the effect of the stimulus is much less for uh, much later stimulation, T30. So it's more or less is, uh, the data is overlapping. So one of the things that I think why the truncation happened is that it is because we can talk about that later. Uh, deceleration is due to the OPN of uh, reactivation. So this is kind of the last slide before the conclusion. So now the next thing is that we try to confirm with a different duration of stimulus. So one thing to you notice is that the effect still happen even with about one millisecond duration of pulse. So here in the IPSI, you can see that basically all of them produce a hypermetria here for both and we only do it in two, two places because of we have to don't have time for the animal behavior. We only do it early here or later at the T20. The effect is the same. Basically, this is the control. And then when you give a 1.25 millisecond pulse, amplitude significantly increase. You increase the duration of the light. It linearly increase with the lock. Well, because I presented here as a doubling, so I plotted as a lot. So, but for T20, you get the same regression. Basically, the slope is not significantly different between the two. Basically, you have the same rate of increase. The only difference is that you get a larger initial increase than with the T10. So you have to affect. So the system still accumulating the perturbation, but the initial effect of the perturbation is larger for later pulse. That's in explain why you get larger increase, a larger hypermetria for later pulse. For the contra, even a single millisecond pulse will reduce your speed, your peak velocity. But extending the speed further doesn't do anything. Basically, it doesn't change doesn't reduce the peak velocity more. But of course, because you keep on inhibiting the uh, burst neuron longer, then the acceleration amplitude actually decreasing as your pulse is longer. But because of the feedback compensation and you get reacceleration, it's actually the deceleration amplitude also increasing. And then and if you sum them, there is no change in the saccade amplitude. But the effect for the later pulse for the contraversive, you extend, you will get the first, you know, one millisecond will reduce the amplitude of the deceleration amplitude. Of course, it's becoming reducing the deceleration of the saccade, but longer pulse, you got nothing. No change. So that's basically the message. So now what? Now this is, sorry, this is the last one actually. Now we have gone through that. So I'm kind of, I hope you are convinced that there is a compensation is going on, right? But who actually does the comp compensation? Well, according to the feedback theory, it should be the feedback loop, right? Well, if that loop is actually influenced by the ipsi passive, ipsi lateral side of the cerebellum, then the time, it should be coincide, coincided with the ipsiversive effect, right? So here, the top two is basically the same data, except here I put uh, a standard error here, which is one standard deviation around the, the curve. So this is the, the control for the red. 
And then this is the IPSI perturbation for at early time. This is for SQ. And then you can see that the change is happening that we detected ha happening on the blue line here and with the 95% confidence interval there. And this is in Tommy, it's the same thing. It, uh, this is where, where the change happened after IPSI versive uh, perturbation. Now we compare it with the contraversive perturbation. As you know, the contraversive perturbation, you have compensation. And the compensation is happening when the saccade start to re-accelerate, right? And what, which is the time here by the green line here with the 95% confidence interval again. And as you can see, they are coincided. And it's the same thing, the same story is about two milliseconds. It's actually less than two millisecond difference here for Tommy contra direction. So in conclusion, the time re-acceleration compensation of contra is coincided with the time of the effect of T0 ipsi, ipsi perturbation started. So that means we think that the ipsi lateral OMVCFN is actually part of that feedback loop, the forward model that actually responsible for the contra compensation. And that is the conclusion. So thank you for listening. So basically, this basically I'm just repeating what I have been saying that the contralateral OMV and CFN is part of the inverse model that form the saccadic motor common. It influenced the kinematic of all phases of saccade with short latency. And this is necessary, the short latency, because you want they are so fast, right? You have you want to change it fast. And moreover, the early perturbation was well compensated to keep scat amplitude constant, and at least for the early stimuli, uh, early perturbation. Ipsilateral CFN is part of the forward model that estimates the current eye displacement. It accumulated perturbation effects and did not appear to directly influence the on direction. As you can see, no change in the peak velocity due to the longer latency. And activity of ipsilateral OMV CFN during all phases of scat influence, basically, most of the time, I think we tend to think that the IPC side of the cerebellum, the CFN or the OMV, tend to only affecting the deceleration. But actually, all aspects of their burst early during the saccade or later during the saccade, they are affecting uh, saccade amplitude. But the expression happened during the deceleration. The ipsi lateral OMV and CFN appear to underlie the compensation of the motor command perturbation. So that's basically the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roby. Um, let me ask if you have any questions for Roby. Uh, Roby, you began the presentation by showing that uh, 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 inactivation of the vestigial produces uh, very clear effects, uh, ipsiversive and controversive. So, the most important aspect of that result, I thought, was that there was no compensation for yes, yes. Um, either side. Can you put that in the context of the results that you just showed us with stimulation? This is what I think what happened is that that's actually supporting the idea that they are not in the, I mean, they are in the loop because now you take them out. I mean, the CFN is so small that it's just gone, basically. So basically then, it's just becoming either too weak or just non-existent that you just cannot do the uh, compensation anymore. Actually, when you just started uh, the inactivation, because we redo it with, the, with Yoshiko and Rick Robinson, uh, earlier, the effect for the contra, they don't go down as fast. So, the ipsi is easier to see. And many times, actually, if your injection is off, the contra effect is much smaller. Basically, the hypometria is much smaller compared to the hypermetria. So that's what it is. What wonderful. Um, thank you. Rich, you have raised your hand. Yeah, thanks for the uh, talk. If you could go back to your basic block diagram slide, I just had uh, a question. Um, this one's good. This one's good. Where where you have the comparison? So um, obviously, this is kind of a, a you know in the, the the learning world, we think of the prediction being compared with the feedback, right? right. And here, the predictions uh, are being compared with the displacement command. 
um, and that's that's what I guess is going to allow for sort of the online uh, correction. Is that right? right. Yes, correct. And, um, just uh, I don't know. I was looking at this and thinking about um, who listens to who. So, if the prediction comes back less than the command, um, is the command reduced to try to match the prediction, or is the command increased to try to compensate for the fact that the prediction is less than what the command expected? Yes. Well, okay. To answer your question, uh, actually, uh, when I was a graduate. Uh, under, uh, with I was a graduate student, uh, we tried to see what happened with the command, which is actually we assume, I guess I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to your question here. Mm -hmm. So that the command we assume is actually coming from the superior colleagues, you know, whether they are changing or not, right? So we basically uh, slow the movement by injecting a musimol in the ponds, and the movement slow, but simultaneously, we also record it from the superior colleagues. So what happened is that, well, we don't have exact proof because we don't, we only record it to the side that actually coded for the, uh, for the SCAD that we tested. Say, for example, we tested 10 degree SCAD, so horizontal 10 degree SCAD, so we are recording at 10 degree SCAD in the colleagues, right? So, and then, Another uh, a pipette is coming to the to the ponds, and then we injected the musimol, and scats becoming slower. So what happened in the superior colliculus at that time is that their activity does not disappear. We say it's moving. At, we don't know it might be moving, but what's uh, actually significant is that the activity is actually becoming wider, basically longer. Basically, it is becoming longer uh, and is actually uh, linearly related uh, with the duration of the movement itself. Mm -hmm. So that does that answer your question. So we don't, I don't know exactly whether it's actually the other side, like say at eight degree location or, or maybe 10 degree location, whether they're becoming more active, they are changing. But uh, the only thing that we see is that they reduce, most of them reduce their amplitude, but they becoming wider, longer, longer active. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Solomon uh, has raised his hand. Solomon? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, given that the displacement command is is not just done by the cerebellum, it's also done by the burst generator. Um, so then the, the, the predicted eye displacement, would you argue that that's just a cerebellar thing, or it's also a combination? I would say that's probably the uh, internal uh, in the cerebellum. So... So here I can, I feel the result here is that the, my speculation is that the, the integrator here is located because basically I'm, I don't know whether I will get to the, that question exactly. So because we perturbing actually the activity of the P cells, right? Basically that's what actually changes. So I, I see that it's probably the likelihood that where the, Prediction happened, but it's basically where the integrator, the displacement integrator here is in the, it must be downstream from that uh, P cell, right? So, well, it, possibility it could be through a loop within the cerebellar cortex, where uh, has been, and it has been suggested before, there is a possibility that loop actually performing some sort of uh, integration, or maybe through a longer loop that will be going to the brainstem and then and coming back as a mossy fiber again. So, and all of those will carry the predicted uh, displacement signal. And then the colliculum sig signal is still act is still there as long as the SCAT is still ongoing. And it will still, in theory, would still be compared somewhere. Well, uh, my guess is must be in the cerebral. Does it answer your question? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I guess you assume it's mostly cerebellar. So again, maybe another follow-up quick question. Do, is your prediction that in a normal saccade, 
the contra and ipsi should be exactly equal? Uh, well, this is uh, so. You, are you saying that the yeah, uh, saying that the cerebellar uh, contra, contra side, left and right side, will change role depending on the direction of the movement? Is that what? Yeah, right? but but in equal. Prob yeah. Probably so. Okay. Probably so. That's okay. what I, I think. What happened? Because at least if you're looking at the downstream, they are also changing direction. I mean, changing. It's they are changing role. So one side would be active and the other side would be less active or silent until much later. So I would imagine that the cerebellum will, will have to uh, be consistent with those uh, changes that happen in the, in the brainstem. Does that answer okay. it? Okay, yeah, thank you. Roby, we had a question from Maria and I don't know if you can see your chat, but I can read it for you. Okay. Do you think if one investigates longer time intervals of stimulation, there may be different effects from the OMV stimulation. So initially in the monkey squirrel, we did a longer stimulation. Basically, uh, that was actually the, uh, the one that uh, with Yasmin and Yoshiko and Gregor that we published in 2017. We basically were trying to simulate the CFN inactivation. We trigger we trigger it still on the beginning of the movement, but we let the light on for hundred at least hundred milliseconds. So we don't we see basically what actually what the CFN inactivation is. You know you know what what you get from the CFN inactivation basically the contra side becoming smaller and the ipsi side becoming larger, but to much less extent. I mean, I mean because the, the optogenetic is not going to express in all P cells, right? I mean, the, some other cells are still normal. So, so that's basically what we see. So it is, and, and the compensation basically, you still get the hypometria, so that's mean for in regard for the compensation. So the compensation is less. So it's becoming less compensated. So yeah, the, the shorter pulse is really tell us that we can see that compensation. But if you use a longer pulse, longer light, you still see some evidence of the compensation, but it won't be complete even for the earliest pulse. You know, you know well, we, that, that pulse is started at the beginning of the sky. So it's basically the same as T0, except you extend it long. So the compensation is much less. So basically you get hypometria. So that is that does that answer your question? It's, I think so. Um, I'm yeah. gonna skip uh, um, she has a couple more questions. Maybe I can just ask one more. Um, do you think she's asking about uh, the uh, do you think the effects that we're that you're seeing is it something specific to saccades or more control of gaze? So, for example, would you expect to see effects in head-free animals with respect to neck muscles? Ah, I see. I would say that uh, I don't know the answer to that because, but my speculation would be at, I think you probably be clearer you will get a clearer effect on the eye part of the gaze, which is look like a saccade, basically a saccade. But I would imagine is that for the contra, you might see some slowness on the head movement, but that's, that's just a guess, uh, uh, I'm not sure. But basically for the saccade part, basically, well, initially that's basically what brought you to the to the target, I think you see the same effect, but again, then the 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 head will counter rotate. I, I think that probably won't be affected. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Ruby. Thank you, oh, everyone. Thank you. thank you. Are there any other questions for Ruby? All right. Good night. Yes, Sorry. I really Can I ask a really, it's probably also very naive, but um, you mentioned at some point that you are seeing that if you stimulate on T0 and T10, that you see the same effect, right? 
the the effect is rather similar and uh, for yeah for well especially for the ipsi fab safe direction and for the contra fab safe yes but the the t0 uh, t10 is less compensated usually all right so why is there um, a good reason or do you do you have speculations why this might be i'm just so for the contra fab yeah for the contra fab safe because the t10 is actually appear later than the, about uh, uh, 10 milliseconds later than the t0 so that means the stimulation is much closer to the peak velocity so the system has much less time to reduce the peak velocity much but you still have a deceleration and then of course you also have less time to compensate does it make sense yeah yeah thanks thanks Thank you, Irene. Thank you for the question. Thank you, everyone. Good to see everyone. Bye-bye. Um, next week. Bye.